1916, uh, the war in Europe, World War I, had been raging for nearly two and a half years. Uh, casualties were, were astronomical. Uh, nobody had ever seen this kind of carnage before. Um, realizing that, and based on his own political philosophies, Woodrow Wilson had run on the slogan, run for re-election in 1916 on the slogan, he kept us out of war. Um, and he, after his election, um, he made an effort um, to act as a mediator between the Allied and Central Powers uh, to negotiate a conclusion to World War I. Uh, he was rebuffed by both sides uh, and very frustrated that, that he'd been un unable to, to attain that, that goal. At the same time, uh, things began to turn uh, the United States against Germany and the other central powers. Uh, in January, the Zimmerman telegram was exposed where the German foreign minister was conspiring with Mexico uh, to bring Mexico in on their side should the U.S. enter on the Allied side uh, with promises that Mexico would regain the territories that they lost in the Mexican War. Uh, at the same time, or very soon thereafter, uh, the Germans declared unrestricted submarine warfare on any shipping coming into the Allied countries. And they immediately began sinking ocean liners and um, cargo ships, uh, military vessels, whatever, uh, were in the area. And the casualties began to mount and, and the outrage uh, in the public began to mount uh, that this was, this was happening and the Americans were dying at German hands. Um, the pressure began to mount on Wilson to do something. Um, the Germans were really making their, their last ditch stand. The, the Russian Revolution had occurred in November 17 and um, they were going to be able to get all the troops they had on the Russian front and bring them to the Western front uh, to confront the, the British and the, and the French. Um, so the unrestricted warfare was setting, submarine warfare was setting that up to put logistical um, challenges, create logistical challenges for the Allied powers uh, while the Germans brought troops forward and there was going to be one more grand uh, offensive and the Germans thought they could win the war. Um, by April um, 1917, Wilson and the American public had had enough. On April 2nd, Woodrow Wilson went before Congress and requested a declaration of war against the Central Powers. Congress debated it uh, for several days and on April 6th um, voted to approve the formal declaration of war and the United States then entered the conflict on the side of the Allies. The United States Army at that time was about 113,000 men, uh, poorly equipped, um, not much artillery, not many machine guns, all the things that were proving to be uh, um, d dominant and crucial uh, in the fighting that was going on in World War I. Um, it was the 17th largest army on paper uh, in the world, which for a country that purported to be a world power uh, didn't say much for the investment we were making at the time. Uh, Wilson and members of his administration believed that uh, Americans would rise uh, to the call to arms and begin enlisting in the military. They were sorely disappointed when after the first month only 73,000 men had, had enlisted. Uh, so they knew they needed to do something else. Uh, the only real option at that point then was to uh, consider a draft. And in May of 1917, uh, Congress passed uh, the Selective Service Act. The decision to, to adopt the Selective Service Act was, was a painful one uh, because, because the memories of the Civil War were relatively fresh. Uh, when you put it in the context uh, of, of kind of present time, Less time had expired since the end of the Civil War in 1917 than has expired since the end of World War II and now. Um, and for us, we still, we still have grandfathers or, or great-grandfathers that served in World War II, and the same was true uh, at the time. There were grandfathers and great-grandfathers telling stories about the Great War uh, that, they had, that they had fought in. Um, during that war, Lincoln had 
uh, been forced to uh, go to a, a draft uh, in order to fill out the Union Army in, in 1863 uh, because of all the losses that had occurred and a slowdown in enlistment rates. Um, and there were draft riots in, in New York City and, and other major eastern cities. Uh, and so for politicians in 1917 contemplating a new uh, draft, they were afraid that that, that decision would, would trigger draft riots. Uh, it didn't. Um, and there was very little protest. Um, people ac accepted the need to, to do that uh, and really responded well to the, to the requirements of the Selective Service Act. Before the war began for the United States, uh, Western Anne Arundel County was kind of out of the way. Uh, not a lot going on. The principal uh, features were the, the railroad lines that, that traversed the county uh, north, south, east, west, and converged at Annapolis Junction. Congressman Charles Linthicum of Maryland uh, was looking at the, at the opportunities that would be created as part of the Selective Service Act. Um, the War Department was authorized to create what were called cantonment areas, and cantonments are are temporary military facilities as opposed to a, a fort. A cantonment, camp, fort kind of is a is a progression as you get more and more uh, uh, more and more facilities uh, on a on an installation. <clears throat> so, uh, Linthicum was looking at this this idea that there's going to have to be a cantonment in this region somewhere. Why not Maryland? Uh, he and a number of businessmen looked at it and believed there would be about $20 million of economic benefit for Maryland if a Maryland site was, was selected. Uh, so they kind of keyed in on Annapolis Junction and went to work uh, lobbying the War Department for one of the cantonment areas for the select selectees or the draftees uh, to report to be in the vicinity of Annapolis Junction. And he cited the, the proximity to the Port of Baltimore, um, the availability of rail lines to move uh, men and equipment uh, readily, uh, the lack of population in the area, so there'd be minimal um, disruption, and proximity to the capital, uh, because um, Washington would want to see what was going on and be able to make an appearance and kind of judge for themselves how the training was going without having to travel to Kansas or or Alabama or someplace else. Um, for all those reasons, uh, in June uh, 1917, the War Department selected the Maryland-Annapolis Junction site as one of 16 cantonment areas to bring the selectees um, for mobilization and training. And the site at Meade was designated to receive selectees from Pennsylvania, Maryland, and the District of Columbia. There's, there's a couple of, of uh, theories um, that none of them are, are particularly good, I don't think. Um, one traces the term back to the Mexican War. Um, the uniform then was, was a blue wool. Um, as the troops marched through the alkali deserts and so on in Mexico, the powdery uh, dust got on them and turned them white and pasty. Uh, and, and that's where the, supposedly the phrase was born. But, but you don't see it being used in the Civil War or, or the Spanish-American War, so that's not all that um, uh, convincing. Um, they'd gone to complete adoption of a khaki uniform, which had also happened in the Spanish-American War, but in a much grander scale. Uh, so maybe the khakis uh, gave, gave birth to the, to the doughboy. Uh, so nobody really knows. The first uh, selectees to arrive to form the basis of the 79th Division came from Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. Uh, later on, Baltimore came in, uh, Eastern Shore, uh, Western Marylanders uh, came in at separate uh, times, and infantry regiments were built uh, geographically around those selectees. Uh, so the the, um, the 313th uh, Infantry Regiment of the 79th Division was called Baltimore's Own. Uh, 
uh, it was primarily Baltimore selectees uh, with a, a mishmash of people from Howard County, Anne Arundel County, Baltimore County, uh, the Central Maryland region. Uh, another uh, regiment, um, the uh, uh, 315th, um, was formed of Eastern Shore crabbers, um, Western Maryland uh, farmers, timbermen, industrial workers, uh, and DC um, selectees. And then Philadelphia and Pennsylvania made up the other two regiments of the 79th. In addition to that, they had to fill out all the, the other elements of a, of a division. Uh, there was a field artillery brigade and a, and a uh, engineer uh, battalion and a, a signal battalion and a logistics battalion, a uh, medical uh, battalion, and, and so on to form that 40 to 50,000 man organization that was a U.S. infantry division, which was about twice as large as a British or French division. Uh, and that was part of the strategy of the U.S. that we would build these huge organizations uh, that would have the heft and weight um, to break through the, the German lines. The 92nd Division was an all-black, one of two all-black divisions uh, that was formed. Initially, the idea was, was to take uh, black uh, selectees and just put them into labor battalions and scatter them around the different units in a support role. And the African-American community rose up and said, you know, no, uh, we're, we're selectees, we're fighting, um, we want weapons and arms, we want to be treated like our white counterparts. Um, the idea of, of uh, integrating the force was, of course, off the table, uh, but the idea of creating two uh, black divisions uh, was instead adopted based on the example of the, the Buffalo Soldiers, the 9th and 10th U.S. Cavalry, and, and some other earlier versions of that. Um, so their higher ranking officers were white, but um, non-commissioned officers and junior officers up to um, junior field grade were, were African Americans. Um, as a sign of the times, they didn't want the whole division coming together and forming and, and being armed. The idea of having 50,000 armed sure, black sure people in that. the United States, <laughs> you know, did not sit well for a congressman from Mississippi or, or something. So they broke up the division and trained them in different parts. So one of the regiments for the 92nd Division was trained at Camp Mead. Um, you also had hospital units formed. So the University of Maryland uh, Medical School created a base hospital of its doctors and nurses. They were brought to Fort Meade, inducted, and received their initial training before they went to form a, a base hospital. Johns Hopkins University uh, Medical School uh, was actually the first group of Marylanders to deploy, so they didn't go through the Camp Meade, they went earlier, but that was another case where you, where you had that. And African-American faculty um, from Johns Hopkins uh, and other schools in, in the area formed a base hospital to support the 92nd uh, and 91st divisions, which were the two African-American ones. The word went out that the armistice was scheduled to begin at the 11th hour of the 11th day, 11th month, so 11 o'clock on November 11th, 1918. The armistice was scheduled to, to kick in. But Pershing's orders were to continue to be aggressive, to keep the pressure on the Germans so that they wouldn't uh, welch on the, on the armistice. Um, the, uh, General Kuhn ordered aggressive patrols and ordered an offensive, a small offensive operation uh, to be carried out by the 314th uh, Infantry Regiment and the 313th. Um, so one of those last actions uh, saw a uh, group of men from the 313th Infantry uh, pinned down by a German machine gun. Um, and the Americans were all saying, you know, let's just stay, stay down, stay under cover, it's almost 11 o'clock. Uh, 
And the Germans were basically telling them, you know, stay down. It's almost the armistice. One of the guys from Baltimore, uh, his name was Gunther. He had, and so he was German-American, and he had written a letter uh, back home telling his cousin uh, not to join up, that, you know, it's not all that it was cracked up to be and just advising against him joining up. The censors picked up on that, and Gunther was, um, was court-martialed for un-American activities um, and busted from sergeant uh, down to private. Um, so he was humiliated um, and had a chip on his shoulder and was trying to prove that he was an American as, as anybody else. So while everybody is saying, stay down, stay down, Gunther made a, an attack on this German machine gun. And eventually the Germans who tried not to, to shoot him killed him. So Henry Gunther from Baltimore was the last casualty of World War I. And he's buried in a cemetery in, in uh, Baltimore. German-American society continues to uh, decorate his, his grave on, on uh, Veterans Day. When Pershing got over to France, one of the things he realized he had to have was a switchboard uh, to connect him to the front and to the French and British allies and command posts. Um, the Army Signal Corps was incapable of, of creating what he needed. Plus, he needed French-speaking uh, telephone operators. All the telephone operators in the country were, were women. That was a, a, a job that had been, for whatever reason, assigned to women as soon as Alexander Bell invented the telephone and began creating telephone companies. Uh, the act of connecting lines and doing all that was, was deemed to be women's work. Um, so we had all the trained telephone operators that were what Pershing needed uh, were women. The Army was not, uh, not only it was segregated in terms of race, but in, there, weren't, there were no women in the, in the military. Um, so the decision was made to bring on um, a, a woman's signal corps of telephone operators who were screened, they had to speak French and had to be expert telephone operators, and, and a great number volunteered. And the Army eventually decided to bring them to Camp Meade uh, for their mobilization and training, uh, which happened fairly quickly, and they were sent over to France uh, to form Pershing's switchboard. And colloquially, they were called the Hello Girls. Uh, so we have that. Uh, connection at Camp Meade to the first large-scale induction of women uh, into the armed force of the United States. Those women came to Camp Meade and shipped out overseas from Camp Meade. The, the, the end of it is, is again, kind of tragic. Um, the, the women had been put in for, for awards. Uh, they were author, authorized, uh, all the other troops were authorized, you know, payments and bonuses and, and so on. As soon as the women uh, left the service, um, the officialdom deemed that their service was not equal to that of other soldiers. They weren't really soldiers. Um, so they were denied benefits, denied recognition until an act of Congress in the 1980s um, when they were finally, those that were left, um, were recognized and given their due. Um, so there were already, by the time Pearl Harbor ha happened, there was already a division undergoing training here. Um, once war was declared, the mobilization process went into overdrive as people began enlisting and joining uh, units and new units forming and so on. And Fort Meade became a hub uh, for mobilization. Um, and, and millions of men passed through the gates of, of Fort Meade um, as they were brought into, into service, inducted, and then sent off to wherever they were going to train. Uh, the 29th Division ultimately moved off of Fort Meade and other units came in to train. Uh, specialty units um, were formed. The uh, special services um, units uh, were trained at Fort Meade and that was the entertainment troops.
So Glenn Miller and Joe Lewis and, and those kinds of people passed through Fort Meade doing their basic training as they went off in these, in these service units uh, to help entertain the, the troops and put in athletic programs and, and all of that. It's kind of the forebearers of the USO, um, but these were uniformed members that were active in, on active duty. Um, but some of the stars. functions, yeah. And then they would, the USO helped bring in the, the stars and team them with the services unit. So if you think of White Christmas, um, you know, Bing Crosby and Danny Kay at the start of the movie under fire and stuff, that was kind of a, what a services unit would. They would have a, a, a piano that they could get out or a, a band instruments or athletic equipment or whatever to help uh, improve the morale of troops. So that was here. Uh, the other major uh, activity that went on at Fort Meade uh, during the war was prisoner of war operations. And the headquarters for all POW operations in the country was at, at Fort Meade. And then the headquarters for the East Coast was on, at Fort Meade. And then a POW camp was established on the post where the, the new uh, uh, troop barracks location is uh, next to the gym, the main gym on post. That area was where the POW camp was. And that all began to pick up once we went into North Africa in 1942, began capturing large numbers of, of Germans. Uh, Britain was full up, they couldn't take any more. They, there was no more space, they were struggling to feed their own population, let alone more POWs. So I forget, it was like half million, 600,000 Germans surrendered in, in Tunisia in, in 1943. So those were brought to the United States. And, parsed out to different camps uh, and forts around the, uh, around the country. One of those was, was Fort Meade. Um, then from those, those POW compounds, uh, prisoners were sent out in small detachments um, to do harvesting of fruits and vegetables, to work in the canneries, um, to do all kinds of, of war-related uh, efforts. Uh, they didn't work with munitions or anything, but anything to do with feeding and so on. After the Italians surrendered, there was a large number of Italian prisoners of war there too. After the Italians surrendered, um, Italian prisoners of war went over and uh, bolstered the Odenton Volunteer Fire Department and added to their numbers because there weren't enough able-bodied men to do that. Um, the Italian... Uh, Families in Baltimore City were hoping to find good Italian men for their young ladies. So busloads of Baltimore Italian girls would come down on weekends for dances that were organized with the Italians. Again, this is after Italy surrendered. and They were no longer prisoners of war. They were under another, another status and had a certain amount of, of freedom. Um, so you started to get that to and fro and interaction that was going on. The opening of, of the National Security Agency facility at, at Fort Meade in 1957 was probably marked at the time, but in the grand scheme of things, with the 2nd Army headquarters there, an armored cavalry regiment, that's what defined the, the culture of the insta installation. And that was kind of, it was on the outskirts of the post. It was people, mainly civilians doing things that, that the Army guys didn't really understand. Um, and so it didn't really affect the culture of Fort Meade. Um, a few years later, the Second Army and First Army headquarters were merged, and First Army headquarters was was established at Fort Meade. Uh, and the big facility now that's uh, First Army Division uh, East has just now gone away, but it's it's a huge building on the parade ground that was built for the First Army. So that. First Army oversaw the training of all the uh, units uh, east of the Mississippi, basically. Um, so it was, a, it was a very large headquarters, very prominent headquarters. Armored Cavalry regiments uh, continued to be there. Also in the 1950s, um, Fort Meade um, was a control center, a brigade control center, for the Nike Hercules missile systems that were built around uh, 
the national capital to protect Washington, D.C. from Soviet missile strikes um, and aircraft strikes. So um, the area... It's still there today. It, it's still there right off of uh, 175, kind of the ugly grayish buildings uh, that, are th that are there. Uh, there's a picture uh, from the um, Washington Post of a missile sitting in the middle of the BW Parkway. It was accidentally fired, but the parkway had not opened yet, and it landed in the middle of an unoccupied road, so they hadn't cut the ribbon and opened it, but it's a, it's a cool picture seeing this missile laying there. Everybody's standing around scratching their head, you know, what do we do now? So that, that, that missile defense role continued on. So by that time, you had this, this nucleus of a, of a military post that still had a lot of activities going on, but far and away the dominant organization on the installation was the National Security Agency. Um, you know the numbers there are classified, so it's hard to you know identify the the scale. Uh, but eventually it grows to tens of thousands of people um, that are that are working in a facility that keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and the mission that the National Security Agency is performing becomes more and more critical uh, to national defense. Um, in many ways, uh, signals intelligence um, proves during the Cold War that it is the dominant um, method of collecting intelligence on, on your adversary. Um, and they get more and more creative about how they do that. Um, so the NSA becomes, becomes the fixture. Can I tell you one anecdote, and you don't need to use this, but just being I the guarantee you we're going to use this. Being it's a, going to be good. <laughs> being a commander of Fort Meade, you know, one of my responsibilities was when the president or other dignitaries arrived on post, I was there to you know, welcome to Fort Meade, sir, and, and then I'd move into the background. So uh, President Bush was making a visit to NSA, and they land the helicopter on the parade field, and then do motorcade into into the NSA. And I was standing there with General Alexander, the uh, director of NSA at the time, and uh, waiting for the president to arrive. He arrives, and, and um, General Alexander's got his limo there and everything, and I, I do my duty and welcome to Fort Meade, Mr. President. He shakes my hand, kind of looks around and goes, looking good there, Colonel. I said, Thank you, sir. And then I kind of faded back, and he goes over to the limo and opens the door, and he looks back at me and goes, like that, waves to me to come get in the car. And I look across the, the other side of the car, General Alexander, like, you know, what do you want me to do? And he goes, so I got into the car. So I got to ride with uh, the director of NSA and the president as he was heading over into the secure facility at, at NSA. And uh, just, they were talking classified stuff that was way above my pay grade the time and General Alexander said, you better forget everything you heard. And I said, I did, sir. But what was fun for me was watching the president's eyes as he's kind of checking out the post and the houses as he's going by and everything. And, you know, that's my post that he's, that he's looking at. And then I had the, you know, once we got there, he's escorted up to their big meeting that they're going to have. And I don't have clearance to go into any of those places anymore. I'm, I'm not part of NSA. So I'm sitting in the garage, kind of looking around. Okay, now how do I get, how do I get back to the fort? So I found a, a, a police officer and said, "Hey, can you run me back?" And I managed to do that. And my wife and and uh, Mrs. Alexander had been watching from the balcony of the of the post headquarters, just to you know see, get a chance to get a glimpse of the president. And they they didn't see me get in the car, but they knew I wasn't there anymore when it was it was done. And where did Ken go? So that was a, that was one of the cool things that got to happen when I was there. Of course, we're going to use 